start re, um, with, uh, quickly, I'll um, cover a little bit of your assignment today that I moved to today, um, last uh, time we met, which was the um, hotel reservation problem. And then I want to try to set you up for next Wednesday's assignment. Um, and so we need to uh, spend a bit of time talking about something called game theory uh, to, to be able to make some uh, decisions, strategic decisions based on that. So um, hopefully when you build your, your models for today, you realize that there were similar constraints as what we talked about with the airline example. So you have your capacity constraints. So you have rooms available for Friday. You have rooms available for Saturday. So you're going to have two capacity constraints. The, your, you have your Friday constraint. The, that includes your convention hotel for both the regular rate and the um, two-day rate. And you have your regular hotel, the regular rate and the two-day rate. So you add all those together, and that's how many people are trying to rent a room on Friday. You do the same type of thing to add the number of people who are trying to rent rooms on Saturday. So those would, would be two constraints that, that you had to do. Just like the airline reservations, you had some sort of forecasting situation where you predict this many people will want each of those different types of uh, rate uh, schedules. So many will want to come in for two days for the convention, one day on Friday or Saturday for the convention, and then two days for the regular, one day uh, Friday or Saturday for the regular. So you make sure that you don't offer more uh, hotel rooms than you expect for any of those different rates. So now you've got your, your two capacity constraints, plus you have your six forecasting um, constraints available. And then there is, in the middle of the problem statement, there is one additional addendum that you needed to make sure that you noticed that had to deal with the fact that the convention wanted to ensure at least 50% of the rooms were made available to the convention goers. So you, you needed two um, convention special, I guess, is what I'll call it, um, um, capacity constraints, where you just added the, the two day plus the Friday had to be at least, uh, what was it, 48? Because that would be half the rooms. And the two day plus Saturday also had to be greater than or equal to 48 because again half the half the rooms so these were your then 10 total constraints I think it was pretty easy to figure out what your objective was you multiply the number of rooms that you allocate times the price for each one of those different rates to get your total revenue for those two days and hopefully it was obvious you want to maximize your revenue all right. So you should have come up with a, a solution for, for that um, if you did that. The part that I wanted to highlight in here is the last question in, in the um, problem, part D I think it, it was, um, where it said, what <coughs> if you've, you've sold out your regular, uh, was it Saturday? You sold out your regular Saturday tickets and someone says, I really want to come on Saturday. What should you do? Okay. And um, the, the answer is that's where the uh, sensitivity analysis comes in. If you look at the sensitivity analysis, one of these constraints has to do with regular Saturdays. So you look at that line in your sensitivity analysis and, and you see that the shadow price there, if I remember correctly, is, is $50. Meaning that if you could somehow increase your forecast um, by one, 
then you would increase your objective function by $50. So if we, if we would have forecast correctly and bumped it up by one, we would have made an additional $50 from our, um, from our solution. So we would really like to give that Saturday person a, a re reservation, if we could, because we could make an additional $50 in revenue. So that sounds a little sketchy because, wait, haven't we reserved all the rooms? And um, so the answer is, you have to, to look at that, but if not every room has been reserved yet, remember what we're doing is we're not making reservations, we're predicting how many we should offer to people to buy. Um, if, if the hotel isn't sell, sold out, can we make one more Saturday reservation? than we predicted we would. So what we have to do then is we have to look at the, the Saturday uh, special capacity constraint. And we have to look at it, um, in this case, it's a surplus variable, right? Because it's greater than or equal to, to 48. And we look at, does this constraint have surplus or not? In other words, if we borrow one of the convention rooms on Saturday out of the convention uh, and put it into the regular slot, are we going to violate this agreement we had with the, with the people coming there for the convention? It turns out the answer is no. The, the surplus, I believe in this case, was three. And so if you, if you look at that, you can see, oh, we have three available rooms um, at this convention rate that we could use and still satisfy this constraint. So if, if a new regular Saturday customer comes and says they want to have uh, a room, as long as we haven't doled out those rooms to paying customers yet, we can switch and say, well, instead of offering the Saturday convention rate to 51 people, we'll at, um, offer it to 50 people and increase the number of Saturday because we increased the forecast demand from, I forget what it was, 18 to 19 or, or, or whatever it was. And so the, as long as not all 51 of these people have actually purchased their reservations, what we should do is take one of these offered reservations from the convention special and give it to this Saturday customer instead. Okay? So this, this uh, sensitivity analysis allows us to verify that there's available space to do that and then how much of a profit it's going to make us by doing that. Yeah, Nathan? So if you're taking one away from the convention, which on is the Saturday. On Saturday, which is 28 bucks. Does it increase by 50 or does it increase by 22? It increases by 50. You're saying the difference between them. Yeah. Right, because if you're not offering convention room, then you're not getting those 28 bucks. Right. So right. then isn't it really increasing by 22, your profit? Um, well, so it's, it's not that you're increasing it by the cost so I don't have the numbers in front of me. What, so I make sure I, I say the right thing. Where are you getting the 22 versus the 28? Well, the 28 is the shadow price for um, the convention demand. On, On Saturday. Saturday, yeah. So like, if you offer one less, then you're getting 28 less dollars. And if you give that to the regular, then you're getting 50 more dollars. But because you lost the 28 from the convention, is it a net profit of 22? Or is it 50? No. We... Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, <coughs> we, we, that, we're not changing... We're not changing the um, right-hand side of the Saturday convention. We're only changing the right-hand side of the Saturday regular. But are you getting that room from the convention? Um, <coughs> I, 
we, we are getting it not from, we're, we're getting it from a surplus that we didn't need, right? So there's three just convention rooms that we're not going to get any money from. That, we, that, we're, that we're offering that would not, uh, that we don't have to. Okay. Right. Our agreement is that we have at least 48 convention rooms. Right. And we're offering 48 plus the surplus of three, of 51. Right. So we're going to stop offering 51, and we're going to only offer 50. We're still going to meet this right here, and we are still going to meet our convention forecast. We're going to meet the number of people that that we expect to arrive. On, on Saturday for the convention, okay? But what we're doing is we're increasing the number of people who we are expecting to come regularly on Saturday by one. That's all we're doing. We're changing that forecast value by one. And so that's why we should only um, consider the shadow price for that one change, the, the right-hand side of the, the regular Saturday customer um, we didn't decrease the forecasted number of people who were coming on Saturday for the convention. We only increased the number of people who were coming regularly on Saturday. So we only want to consider one of those shadow prices. We didn't have to change both of those right-hand sides. But if you add the Saturday only and the two nights together, there, there is 51 rooms for the convention. Um, Unless my answer is wrong, which it could be. Right, right. But, but we don't, we, we made sure that our offer, let me use something brighter here. We made sure our offer, that's almost as bad. Is that isn't because it? it's, it's what's planned and not actually? Yes, yes. So, so 51 is just what we've allocated. Right, so the offer that we make is less than or equal to the forecast, right? We don't have to give rooms to everyone who comes to our hotel, right? Right. We just, I, if, if we're sold out, we're sold out. What, we, what we're trying to predict is how many people would come and we don't offer um, too many people the wrong type of hotel room. So that's why we have this, this, this less than or equal constraint here. So we're predicting that there will be more people coming to us for the Saturday convention rate than we can handle. That's okay. We would prefer to sell regular rates rather than convention rates because we make a higher profit. Right? So we're not reducing this forecast. We're, we're keeping this forecast the same. We're just reducing the number of tickets, the number of reservations we make available to those conventioners in lieu of our forecast for the regular people have been off by one. And so we increase that forecast and we're able to make more money selling it to a regular payer rather than a conventioner as long as we meet this, co this special capacity constraint here. So this, because of that, our forecast didn't change for the convention people. And so that's why we don't have to look at the sensitivity analysis part for that. That remain the same. The same number of people are coming, we're just not going to give as many rooms to those people. And as a result, we make 50 extra bucks. All right? I'm not saying, you know, it's, it's terrible business practices, if, if you ask me, that we increase the regular and overbook our hotel. That's not what I'm trying to say, <laughs> right? Um, it is what airline reservations do, right? Because they expect people to miss planes. It's what rental car people do because people apparently don't show up to rent cars or whatever. But, um, and even hotels do this, right? Mm -hmm. But you, even if you don't want to do that business practice, you, you know there's different people coming with different rates, and you're going to sell it to the person who's willing to pay you the most. Okay? In fact, this is 
the primary business model of online websites like Priceline.com or Hotels.com, right? They are basically updating this forecast every time someone buys a hotel room. They say, oh, okay, well based on our now more expert forecast, now this is the types of hotel rooms and the types of uh, airline <coughs> rates that we should sell that's gonna maximize our sales for, for this company. Okay, that's how those systems work, is exactly looking at this, the sensitivity analysis, selling, oh, I can make 50 extra dollars if I make this room available at this rate instead of this rate by, by doing that. So you can have whole businesses based on these kind of models. They're just a lot bigger models rather than two days of hotel rooms for a single hotel. You've got thousands of flights and seats available at, at multiple different uh, rates, right? So you need really big, powerful computers uh, chugging these out as, as quickly as you can. All right? Okay, well, let's um, then change topics here um, to game theory. Um, so game theory, is, is not like Monopoly or Clue or board game or, or a sporting event. Game theory is a mathematical concept um, that tries to describe when you've got more than two decision makers trying to act on their own behalf, um, how can we mathematically model those decision makers' uh, uh, options so that we can try to reason about it from a rational perspective um, and say this is what the optimal strategy is. Okay, there are lots of different types of, of mathematical games that are available. We're gonna really restrict ourselves in this class to um, games that are called zero-sum games, okay? Which means that if I win, then you lose kind of thing, right? So if I'm a business and I make the sale, then my competitor doesn't. Right? So I get increased market share, they get decreased market share. So there's a, a symmetry in, involved in, in what's, what's going on between the, these different entities. So let, uh, let me give a, the, the uh, stereotypical game theory uh, known as Prisoner's Dilemma, which, by the way, is not a zero-sum game. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, it will ha help us at least understand our notation, and we'll understand how we think about things, um, and then and then we'll slip into these their, these zero sum games. So with the prisoner's dilemma, um, as it's typically stated, you've got uh, two uh, not so great people um, who have been arrested. Uh, person A and person B, and they're actually, they are guilty of, of the crime here, okay? Uh, and so, um, the, you, you see this all the time on, on cop shows on TV, right? They separate out the, the two um, or, or more people involved, and they try to get one person to rat on the other person, right? So here's, here's, the, here's the two options, right? Um, person A can remain silent, right? They're, they're, uh, or they can rat on the, the, the other person, right? And they both have th that, that, those same two options, okay? So if that's the case, I'm, I'm going to do this in color here. Um, so I'll make A red, and actually I'll do blue, so and be blue. So if, if A is silent and B is silent, that's what this box represents right here, then what's gonna happen is, well, we're, we can't convict them of the most severe crime because we have some circumstantial evidence, but we don't have the, the full thing against them. So um, B is going to get uh, some sort of plea bargain for one year, and so, so is A. They're, they're each gonna get this, this one year in jail. But if the cops uh, can get uh, B 
to rat on A, but A, but A is, is staying silent, then the, the agreement is A gets to go free, right? If you, if you tell me what they did, then, then we'll let you off, right? <coughs> but B gets three years in jail. Wait, the, other way around. the person who rats on the other person. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so this is three years. Yes, that means you're following. Good. <laughs> okay, and the opposite is true if A is the one who's... Uh, talks and B remains silent, so now this goes free and three years. But the ideal, right, for the cops is to get them to both uh, say it, it reveal their um, secrets and they both end up with two years. Okay? So this is our this is our notation that we're going to use here. So let's think about this logically here by um, considering person A and if they remain silent to start off with. If person A remains silent, what should person B do? Right, because right, right. right? they're going to go free. Okay, well what happens if person A, they should still do it, right? Because this two years is better than three years. Right? So in either, no matter what A does, it doesn't matter what A does, B should choose to, to share the details of their crime. Okay? And, and if we, if we by, by symmetry, if we do the same thing for A. So if B is quiet, what should A do? And if B talks. So what's going to happen in this kind of rational, not only thinking about this situation, is that A is going to choose to rat, because that's in their best interest, no matter what B does, and B is going to choose to rat, no matter what A does, and they end up in this circle right here. Okay? And, and they end up both getting two years uh, of jail for further time. Now, if they were both going to go to jail, conceivably, they would have liked this option over this option. This example was um, was made famous by a mathematician called Nash. Okay, if you've ever watched *A Beautiful Mind*, that movie is about him, um, and. Uh, he studied all kinds of games, and this is this has got a special name. It's called like Nash Equilibrium, and and um, and everything. Um, so the, he kind of popularized uh, the these ideas about how, how these games work right here. So um, any questions about our notation right here? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one decision maker here on the side. We'll have one decision maker here on the top. And all the decisions they can make uh, will correspond to them. It doesn't just have to be two. You can have more than more than one, more than two decisions uh, to make. N not in this particular scenario. So why don't you open your books up? Uh, I think it's section 5.4 now. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to go through an example in this section. So in this case, we've got two companies that are trying to decide what they're going to do. And they've got not two options available to them for increasing market share, but they have, have three. So what are, what are the three options that they have available to them? Okay. So increase advertising. What's another option that they have available to them? Okay, they can discount their merchandise. All right, and what's the third option? 
All right, they can extend the warranty. And they both have the, these options available to them. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing. We have uh, company A and we have company B. And now the difference that I'm going to write down here is because this is a zero sum game, we don't have to write down two values like we did with the prisoner's dilemma. Because anything that positively happens to A is going to be seen as negatively affecting B. And vice versa, anything that positively happens to B is going to be negative in relationship to A, right here. All right? So let's just write all of these in terms of A's perspective. When just arbitrarily picking one, you could pick B just as easily. You're going to get the same answers, okay? So uh, help me out. How much does the market share increase? Read off the numbers to me, left to right, top to the bottom, so we can fill, fill out this, this table real quick here. Four, three, two, negative one, four, one, five, <coughs> two, zero. Okay, and remember, these are in terms of A. So if, if both A and B increase their advertising, we'll say that A is going to increase its market share by 4%. But if A chooses to extend warranties and B um, increases discounts, A is going to lose 2% of market share, which means B is going to increase market share. Okay? So these are the options that, in this scenario, that these two companies have available to them. Uh, and this is what's called their payoff for, for each of the different options that they have available to them. And what we're going to do is we're going to step, go through this step by step just like we did with the prisoner's dilemma. So what we're going to do first is, is consider um, player A, what if they make this choice right here? What if they choose to increase advertising? Okay? If we think in terms of that only, what would, you, what would company B, if they knew um, that company A was going to increase advertising, what would company B do? Extend the warranty. They'd extend the warranty. Why? Because that would only get two rather than three or four. Right. So, so company A has to assume that company B is going to make an intelligent choice. So they're going to say, if, if I make this right here, I can expect to increase market share by two. Okay? I can't expect to do it any more because company B's, you know, hopefully a good company and can minimize the damage from, from that. Okay? What about this middle one? If, if company A chooses to offer discounts, what is company B going to do? Increase advertising. It's going to increase their advertising because they can actually increase their market share as a result of doing that, right? So we, company A is going to expect that if they uh, increase discounts, that they're going to face a loss of market share. Right here. And then finally, if we extend our warranty, what is company A going to expect uh, company B to do? They're going to do the best possible thing they can, right? And, and discount here. OK. So given that A can make a market <coughs> increase of 2% or a loss of 1% or 2%, what is the rational thing that company A should do? It should increase advertising. So we're going to say that company A's uh, ideal is that we're going to increase advertising and expect to get a 2% uh, increase in market share right here. Everyone following so far? Okay, we want to do the same thing now with B. Okay, so if B chooses to increase its advertising, what is company A going to do? They're going to extend their warranty, right? So
So what what should um, uh, so in in this case um, <coughs> B would expect if they increase advertising that this is going to happen to them, right? What is B going to expect to happen if they increase the discounts? What is company A going to do? Increase discounts. They're going to increase discounts as well. That's going to help company A out the most. Okay, and finally, if company B extends its warranty, what are we going to expect company A to do? They're going to increase their advertising, right? That's the best thing that they're going to do. Now remember, over here, company A picked two because that was its best option. What is company B's best option? It, these represent losses for company B, right? So they want, company B wants to minimize these losses. So company B is also going to pick two. Okay, and so what's going to happen is that in this scenario, company A should choose to increase its advertising and company B should it choose to extend its warranty. And as a result, that's what these two companies should do. And because company B is going to expect to lose 2% of market share, which is equal to company A's increase of their market share of two, this is one of these Nash equilibriums that I mentioned earlier. That any time, say, company A wanted to deviate, let's say they wanted to say, oh, well, we're increasing, uh, they're extending their, their warranty. Um, we, we, uh, we don't want to change these. That's not, that's not going to help us, right? That's going to make things worse. And, and company B is going to say, well, they're increasing advertising. We don't want to go here because that's going to help them. So there's no incentive for them to change to, to make a better profit. Com uh, company A says, if I change, I'm going to lose market share. And company B says, if I change, I'm going to lose market share. So this is, this is a natural settling point for both companies, and they're going to both choose to, to pick these. This is what's called a pure strategy. Okay? The best solution for both of us is to pick that uh, decision and to stick with it. Yeah? So do both companies gain 2% in market share? No, because this is worded in terms, in of, terms company of, of A. So company so A, company a is going to gain 2% of market share, and company B is going to lose 2% of market right. share. Kind of disheartening for company B that the best option you can have is losing market share. Right. Yes. So what makes it a pure strategy is that they like both cancel out. Yeah, that that their options say that each other is going to to choo choose an option and stick with it. That there's no incentive for them to change their strategy for something else. Okay. So let's let's see that pure strategy break down. Then okay. Um, I think what your book does is it changes this from a zero to a five. <coughs> All right. So now let's revisit what happened here. We didn't change this row or this row. We did change this row, but it still is going to have the same result, right? If company A chooses to extend its warranty, company B is going to offer discounts. Okay, so now... Um, company A's strategy is not going to change. Company A is going to still want to increase its advertising. That's its best option right here. However, company B has a different story now, right? Well, um, we didn't change this column. We didn't change this column. But we did change this column. So if company B decides to extend its warranty, what is company A going to want to do in response? It's going to also want to extend its warranty. So instead of two, I should keep that there and cross it off. 
the new value here is 5. Okay? And now we're going to get in, um, the company B is going to choose instead of extending a warranty, company B is going to choose to offer discounts because that's its um, least losing proposition. <laughs> All right. Now, so that's what company B is going to do. Okay? So now we, we are already seeing hints that there's something amiss. Because company A is expecting to see an increase in market share of 2%. Company B is expecting to see a market loss of 4%. So there's 2% missing somewhere in there that's not accounted for. And the, the reason why is because if as soon as company B says, I'm going to offer discounts, that's going to that's gonna pull company B to want to go in this direction, right? Because it can, it can get a, a larger market share and move from increased advertising to, to increased uh, discounts. But if company B does that, then company A, I mean, company, if company A does move that move down, then that's going to tempt B to want to move in this direction so they can actually get a market gain rather than a, a market loss. And then that's going to influence company A to want to move down here, right? And, and then you go here and, and you get into this. Um, it's not an equilibria because there's this tension to want to change your mind. You don't want to just stick with your decision because uh, once you stick, once your competitor makes a decision, it influences you to want to change your mind because you can make a better decision, which is going to influence their mind to change their decision, and you get this non-ending wanting to change your decision based on what your your uh, opponent, because it's a game, what your opponent uh, choice is making. Okay. So we don't get a pure strategy in this case. What we have to do instead uh, is to, to do a probabilistic approach. Okay? So you could think about uh, this as saying each boardroom for company A and B has a, uh, a dice and they're going to roll the dice and based on which dice comes up they're going to make a decision. That's probably not the the exact strategy that they're going to employ, but you can think about it in that, in, in that uh, terms. Okay, so um, we need to figure out uh, what probability for both of these companies they should pick any of these given ones. Another way you could think about it is maybe if you were to repeat making this decision over and over and over again, maybe each week you have to repeat saying, hmm, this week what am I going to do for my customers to, to get the best customers? Uh, if you always repeat the same strategy, um, you're going to get in trouble, right? Because the, the other company is going to notice what you're doing, and they're going to pick the, the strategy that's going to benefit them the most. And so you have to vary your strategy so that you're not predictable. Um, and, and so you want to predict, you, you want to get what uh, probability you should choose between the different strategies that you have available to you, okay? Turns out uh, it's the same uh, type of thinking that uh, people who play poker have to do, right? Should I bluff or should I tell the truth? Um, how, how much should I do and so forth, all right? So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to assign a probability to, uh, let, let's consider company A again. We're going to assign a probability for company A uh, for each one of these choices right here. Okay? So, <clears throat> what we're, what we're going to get um, is we will get um, probability of A um, making option one. I'm just going to number these right here. So I'll call this option number one, two, and three. 
and probability A2 and probability A3. Okay? So we could let let's let's start with concrete values and say that each one of these is a third. All right? If each one of these is a third, we can um, look at what now B is going to expect their results to be for each one of these decisions. Right? So if, if B looks at, at company A and says, well, a third of the time they do this, a third of the time they do this, and a third of the time they do that, we can expect to a third of the time lose market share by four, a third of the time gain market share by one, and a third of the time lose market share by five. Right? So what we, we do is we multiply these probabilities here by this column right here to get what we expect overall over the hundreds or thousands of choices that company B makes if they, if they choose to increase their advertising. Yes? Do you do that for each? Yes. So we're going to do that. Um, so let me erase these now. So we would do four thirds, we would do minus a third, and we do five thirds. And we can just add those all up. So that would be eight thirds. Are you following me? Four thirds minus one third plus five thirds. Okay? We can do the same thing here three thirds plus four thirds minus two thirds. That's uh, five thirds, right? And two thirds plus one third plus five thirds, again, gives us eight thirds. Okay? Yes? Is that a sum product? That is a sum product, yes. We're multiplying these values times these, each one, and we're adding them all together. <coughs> all right? So if company A chose to have this probability distribution, what would we expect company B to choose to do? Discount. We would choose, they, we would expect them to do the discount, right? Because that's going to, um, on average, benefit them the most, or hurt them the least, I should say. So here's, here's what we're going to do for company A. We're going to try to figure out which set of probabilities here are going to best benefit us. Who are we? Uh, we are company A in this scenario so far. Okay. So these are probability A1, probability A2, and probability A3 are going to be variables that we're asking our model to say. What should each of these probabilities be? for each one of our actions, okay? And what's going to happen is we're going to get these three values right here for any given probability, set of probabilities. What, what does company A want these values to be? Equal? Not equal, but they want them large, right? Specifically, they want the smallest one of these values to be large, right? Because it doesn't matter if these are giant, these two, if these two are giant, but this one's small, that company B is always going to pick the small option. What they want is they want all three of them to be large, because no matter what B does, it's going to hurt them. That's what company A wants to, to take place, okay? So what, what company A is going to do, is it's got a, another variable, your book calls it gain A, right here, okay? And this is just like the asset allocation problem that you did earlier in the book, where what we want to do is we want this gain A to be as high as possible. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to say that this value right here has to be um, less than or equal to each one of these three computed values right here. And then what do we do with gain A? We, we try to maximize it. Okay, so, so we're going to have <coughs> three constraints in this scenario. We're going to have one constraint that is what our benefit is for uh, company B choosing to increase advertising. One constraint it, for company B choosing discounts. And a third constraint for company B doing extended warranty. And we're just going to multiply these values directly against these probabilities. Okay. Um, and we're going to say that the value that we come up with is always going to be larger than company A's uh, gain. Or at least as large as I should say. So, what, so if we call this, um, let me put it right here. So we do 4. PA1 um, minus PA2 plus 5PA3. That represents this column right here times these probabilities right here. We're going to say that that has to be at least as large as gain A. And we're going to do that for the next column too. 3PA1 plus 4PA2 minus 2PA3 also has to be larger and equal to that gain. And we do it one more time for that last column, which is 2PA1 plus PA2 plus 5PA3 has to be larger than gain A. And now we've got our constraints right here. We have our variables right here. There's one other constraint that we have to add. Yeah, you have to sum the probabilities to one. Okay, right? So PA1 plus PA2 plus PA3 equals 100%. Yes, Anna. Um, where, did, where can you get gain A? That's just a variable that we're going to leave. Um, we're not going to assign it a, 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 a value because it's a variable. We'll let the model try to optimize it. But is that also our objective? It is our objective. Just put a random value to, to get it started. Cool. But then it solves it to that value that you put in it. Like if I put like one into it, it solves it for that thing to be one. I, I don't know, maybe. Come on. Okay, it shouldn't. Um, if, if that doesn't work, you can always assign a cell to be equal, uh, for your objective to be equal to the variable. And so your objective and your variable are two different oh. cells, but their values are identical to each other. So that's what you need to, to do, okay? And when you optimize this, it will keep increasing gain until eventually gain will be, it, it can't go any higher because as soon as it goes higher, it will push that gain above one of these possible choices. And so that will be our limit. That will tell us what our, our maximum gain will be for A and what the probabilities should be for company A. Okay. The cool thing is you can do the exact same reasoning about company B. But instead of going columns times probabilities for A, you can do rows times probabilities for B. Okay. And then, it's, you wouldn't call it gain A, you would call it loss B. 
right? And when we want to do it from company B's perspective, we want to minimize losses. So these, these change um, to less than or equal to losses, and you want to minimize those losses. It turns out if you do that, you will get a uh, you will get an expected gain for A equal to the expected loss for B. All right? You can do, um, for the assignment, you have to do both to show that they equal each other. Yes. Yes. All right. Have a great fall break, everyone. I'll see you in a week.